guys, we are live with uh, Jillian. Um, hi. Hi. Like, I feel so bad to hear again that your son got it and you're actually spending your time to share it with us over here. So I can't be more thankful oh. and grateful with it. Um, Jillian is like a famous attorney um, <laughs> and she is specialized in helping people how to raise money, small businesses and small owners. And um, maybe you want to introduce yourself and tell us um, how we can take advantage of this situation. Yeah. So I, um, thank you so much for having me too. Um, I help small businesses and, and sometimes medium-sized businesses that are looking to raise capital from the crowd and how they can go out and raise that capital. I teach them how to do it legally and how to do it effectively. So what we really want to help you do is stay safe out there. And really what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over the law and what the law is in regards to taking in capital from investors and what you can do to use the law to your advantage and also stay out of trouble. Sounds perfect. <laughs> so um, I'll get started if, if you don't mind. Let me just get no, my... no, no. I, I would just love to. Um, maybe you could just like start and... Uh um like uh show us your tips and how we can take advantage of it uh and then maybe we can get some questions before uh you go is that okay? yeah Perfect. that'd be great i would love, love to get some questions all right so hold on i'm going to share my, my screen here i got a little presentation let's do this Okay, so I, um, like I said, my name is Jillian Sidoti. I'm from Trowbridge Sidoti, and you can find us at crowdfundinglawyers.net. Um, so the first thing I want to go over real quick is just the law and, and just do a great big overview because I know a lot of people, I've, I've dealt with some um, companies in the beauty industry I'm before. Trowbridge Sidoti. And, and a lot of them don't um, quite understand how the law works, um, which is fine. Um, it's, a, it's not an easy law to, to look at, but we wanna look a little bit at the history um, so we understand why we're doing this. So it all went back to the Great Depression. That's when things kind of, you know, it was hell in a handbasket at that time. And, and FDR came out with the New Deal and he came out with, um, a law that's still good law today in 1933, the Securities Act in 1933. Um, and then from there, we've seen the law evolve, be interpreted, what have you. And in 2012, we saw uh, what was called the Jobs Act come out. And the Jobs Act's the Crowdfunding Act. So if you've ever heard of crowdfunding before and you're wondering what it is, um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about how to crowdfund your particular business. Um, and I really do believe that there's going to be a lot of crowdfunding opportunities once we come out of this fog that we're all in right now. Um, so you want to make sure that if you do want to take advantage of the crowdfunding laws and the opportunity that it has, um, that you do it properly because not to do it properly can lead to a lot of issues, um, legally speaking. So, um, one of the things I said in the middle of that slide was I had mentioned something called the Howey case in 1946. The Howey case is really important for us to understand why we do what we do because it is uh, it really tells us, okay, when I'm taking in money from investors, when do the laws apply to me? The Howey case was a farm. The farm decided to subdivide itself into one acre parcels and they made it so that uh, individual investors could buy a parcel of land. Uh, on that land, they grew oranges and the oranges, uh, the Howey company said, hey, investors who are buying this land, I'll, we're gonna farm this land for you. We're gonna sell the oranges for you and then we're gonna give you the profits and you don't have to do anything. And it didn't work out and all the investors lost their money. And so when they lost all their money, the, uh, the investors got really upset and said, you know, you didn't tell us that we could lose all our money. And they sued the WJ Howey company on the basis of securities fraud, which, you know, the WJ Howey company said, no, we sold you a piece of land. That's not true. Um, we didn't, we didn't defraud you. Well, the Supreme court sided with the investors and determined that yes, they did sell a security and they came up with a test. Now I'm telling you all this history and you're in the beauty industry and thinking, why do I need to know about a farm? Well, because the test is what the important part is. And this is, if you're 
taking pictures of slides or, or taking notes or whatever, this is the slide to take a picture of. This was the test that came out of the Howie case and it's still good law today and it still applies to your beauty, uh, your beauty business. So are you looking to your investors for money? And most likely the answer is yes. So you're looking for money from your investors. Are you, is your, are your investors funds all going to go to the same purpose? And most likely the answer is going to be yes to that, because what you're going to be doing is using their money for your business to build it, to pay payroll, to buy supplies, whatever it might be. Then do you tell those investors that you're gonna not only return their money, but you're also gonna give them some other money as well, like a return on investment. So in other words, do the investors have an expectation of profits? And most investors wanna make money when they're investing, right? So they have that expectation of profits. Otherwise, why would they invest? And then finally, through the efforts of a promoter, and that means you, you're doing all the work. In other words, your investors are passive and you are the person making their money work for them. So if you hit all four prongs of that test, when you're going out and looking for capital, then that is when we say, look, we have some rules that apply when it comes to raising capital. And then we also say, okay, we have all these rules that apply. And not only do we have these rules that apply, but we got to find the right group or the right crowd for us. So under the law, there's three different types of investors and the law treats investors, different types of investors differently. And so we have, uh, I hate to put it this way, but I think there's a whole lot more of uh, number three type investors now than there was probably two weeks ago um, because you know wealth is just transferring at a tremendous rate right now in the country um, and very unexpectedly. So we have the number three investor, which is actually a huge part of the country um, about at least 90% of the country, um, which are unaccredited investors. Then part of those unaccredited investors are what are considered sophisticated investors. These are investors who understand the risks associated with investing. Like they have some kind of knowledge, but they don't necessarily have what our number one category has, which is income or net worth. And so an accredited investor is somebody who makes $200,000 a year as an individual, $300,000 a year as a married couple, or has a net worth of a million dollars exclusive to their primary residence. Now I tell you all this stuff because um, it's important because as the law considers these types of investors differently when it comes to crowdfunding, when it comes to just raising capital. So we're going to take a look at that now. So the law allows you to raise capital several different ways, but what I like to call um, are buckets. Now, when you're looking at your beauty business, you got to first think about who is my crowd? Where is my crowd? Who is my crowd? Do I know wealthy people? Do I know not so wealthy people? Do I know a lot of people? Do I not know a lot of people? Do I need to advertise? Do I need to just go to my own network? These are kinds of the questions you want to ask yourself. So on the left hand side of your screen here, you see crowdfunding and crowdfunding uh, allows you to raise up to a million seventy thousand dollars on what is called a registered crowdfunding portal. And examples of these portals would be like WeFunder. As a matter of fact, on WeFunder specifically, I've invested in a couple of beauty companies myself. Um, so WeFunder has a lot of beauty companies. Start Engine is another one. Republic. So depending on what your, your company is and how much money you need, you might want to consider going on a registered crowdfunding portal. And here's why you might want to consider it. It's because you can take money from any investor. So if you remember our one, two, three investor, under, uh, under regulation crowdfunding, you can take money from any investor. You can advertise on that crowdfunding portal for investors. Um, and you can take up to a million seventy thousand dollars Now, the big buts with all of this are that if you 
decide to do reg, uh, reg, uh, regulation crowdfunding on a registered crowdfunding portal, you can only advertise on the crowdfunding portal. You have to go through a crowdfunding portal. And your investors are very limited in how much they can invest. They can only invest up to $10,000 or 10% of their net worth, whichever is less. So you're taking smaller amounts of capital from smaller investors, which is fine if that's your business model. It's fine if you only need a million dollars. Um, you do have to do an audit of your financial statements. That's kind of a pain. Excuse me, I'm going to take these off. They're aggravating me. And they're not doing anything anyhow. So, uh, so these are kinds of the so these are kinds of the things you want to consider. Like if you want to reach a crowd, but you don't mind how much uh, how little they're going to invest, then reg registered crowdfunding portal might be it for you. Um, do you understand that the average crowdfunding investor under this rule invests only two hundred and fifty dollars? So we're really talking about small increments of money. So let's just say we have a business that needs more than a million dollars or uh, we want more than, you know, small amounts of capital from smaller investors. Then we want to start looking towards these two in the middle, 506B and 506C. And so under 506B, we can raise as much money as we want um, from our current network. So what do I mean by our current network? It means people you already have a relationship with or know or you know have either networked with or, or have done business with before or your friends or your family. The big but with 506B is twofold. One, you cannot advertise for investors. So again, it has to be your current network. It has to be people you have what is called a substantive pre-existing relationship with. So if you have those types of in investors, then um, you can take those people in. Um, and the types of investors you can use are numbers one and two. So one is our accredited investor, the people who make $200,000 a year as individuals or $300,000 a year as married couples or a million dollars of net worth, or you can take in up to 35 sophisticated investors and those are those investors who might not have that income or net worth, but they understand the risks associated with investing. Now, a question I often get asked is how do I know if somebody's sophisticated? And it's a subjective test that you have to be objective about. So in other words, if somebody says to you, yeah, I'm sophisticated, but then asks you silly questions that don't denote sophistication, then they're probably not that sophisticated. So you have to be really objective about it, but there is no test of sophistication. It's just something you kind of have to evaluate on a very objective basis. It's hard to do, especially when you want people's money. So you can take 35 sophisticated uh, investors and as many accredited investors as you want under rule 506B here. Under 506C, you can take, um, uh, accredited investors only. So again, our wealthy investors, you can take them, but you have to verify that they're actually accredited. So the, the onus is on you to make sure that they're accredited. Um, and you can advertise for investors. So if you want to go out to Facebook, you don't have a network that you want to tap into or that of pre-existing relationships, then you can use Rule 506C, go on Facebook, go on LinkedIn, go anywhere and say, hey, who wants to invest in my business? And uh, 506C will work for you, but you can only take accredited investors, which leads us to the biggest uh, offering that you can do, uh, which is a mini IPO under regulation A+. plus. Now, I normally tell people you have to really think about it before you consider doing a mini IPO because a mini IPO really requires you to have a lot of upfront capital to do because here's what we're gonna do. All of these other ones, crowdfunding, 506B, 506C, do not require any review by the Securities Exchange Commission. In other words, you just go out, you prepare your paperwork, the paperwork you need to actually do this, and you go out and you do it. And, and I, of course, recommend you use an attorney to have you prepare this paperwork because it is a big disclosure document and it's got to be done correctly. Just because it's not getting reviewed by the SEC, um, it still needs to be done correctly. So 
Under those first three rules, we don't have any real government oversight. Under this one, however, we do have government oversight where the um, Securities Exchange Commission is going to review your documents prior to allowing you to go out and raise capital. But the great thing about this mini IPO is you can take money from anybody you don't have to do a registered crowdfunding portal. You can advertise yourself for the investors. Um, you can raise up to $50 million. Uh, and, you know, again, you can go out on Facebook, LinkedIn, what have you. So who do I recommend uses a mini IPO? Usually I recommend this for people who are already have some kind of built in audience. Um, and so they have an audience. Um, and they want to tap into that audience on a different level um, and say, who wants to invest with me? So uh, like the biggest client that people on here may be aware of that I've done this for is a guy by the name of Grant Cardone and he did it for real estate. So he had previously been doing offerings under 506C and only allowing accredited investors. He had a big audience of unaccredited investors that he didn't necessarily knew, know, but they knew him. And so he wanted to reach that audience and give them the opportunity to invest in real estate with him. So he took on this Regulation A and did um, a Regulation A offering. And so usually my most successful clients who use Regulation A are people who already have um, a big audience that they want to tap into, or they have a marketing budget in order to create an audience for themselves. So you got to understand because you to raise you know, money and make it worth it, you really need to be able to go out there and solicit and have the tools to do that. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so how, when can you advertise for investors? You can advertise for investors under 506C for accredited investors only, Regulation A, that's our, that's our mini IPO. And finally, under uh, Regulation CF on a registered crowdfunding portal, up to a million seventy thousand dollars from any investor. This is just a quick little breakdown of the rules. Uh, I actually have. A I'm going to give you guys a chart, and um, I'll send that off to you, Arena, and you can send it off to your your crowd. Um, so I just want to give you an idea of what the process looks like. Now I have these slides for Regulation A. I'm not under the impression at all that any of you are gonna jump right into Regulation A. But this process is the, is the big map for all the things that have to be done, right? If you were gonna go big or go home, you were gonna do a Regulation A. So I'm gonna show you what a Regulation A looks like, and then I'm gonna tell you the steps you need to take in order to do any of the other offerings. So that's why I use Regulation A as an example. Okay, so, the first thing you want to do, regardless of whether you're doing a Regulation A or you're doing a Regulation D 506 C or B or a Reg CF, is that you want to start getting your marketing together now. What is the message that you're going to give to your investors uh, going forward? What is the why as to why they're going to invest? Um, and you want to start working on that and getting that messaging out there right away. Um, and that doesn't have to necessarily mean uh, you should invest with us because you're going to make lots of money. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be that that never that strategy usually doesn't work. Um, that strategy usually has the opposite effect. What you really want to do is give people the why you're even doing your business in the first place. So. Um, I'm just trying to think of uh, like Paul Mitchell. I'll use Paul Mitchell as an example. I don't know why that's the first thing to come to the top of my head, but Paul Mitchell, you know, he got his uh, start or, you know, he got really popular and famous because he would only sell in hair salons. And uh, it was like, you know, supposed to be this exclusive line um, that was better quality materials and things like that. And those were all the whys 
to why you would invest in Paul Mitchell. And so you got to kind of figure out why are people buying your product is going to also be the why as to why uh, people are going to uh, in, invest in your business as well. So you kind of want to have that same marketing message. You just, you just augment it a little differently instead of somebody who's going to be using the product, somebody who's going to be investing in the product, but it's the same, it's the same thing or the service. Um, you know, one of my really dear friends is a um, esthetician, amazing esthetician. She, and, you know, what's her marketing message? You get individualized attention. Um, we use high quality products. We love what we do, things like that. Okay. So then the next thing you're going to want to do is to start getting your legal documents together. And this is the part where we're taking all of this information. All right, we're choosing which bucket we're going to be in. Now, what do we have to do in order to use that, that rule effectively? And these are all the things you want to put together. So step one says put your off together your offering, hire a securities attorney and test the waters. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing any one of those four rules that I was talking about, what you have to do for investors is do what I call the three Ds, disclose, disclaim, and details. Disclose, disclaim, and details. So you want to disclose all material facts. And what all material facts are, are anything that an investor would need to know in order to make an informed investment decision. So like if you're being, if your company's being sued, I think that's a material fact that would sway the mind potentially of an investor. So you need to disclose that to them. Then you have to disclaim any potential liabilities. Like uh, you have to tell them all the risks. You have to tell them what the rules are. And then you have to give them all the details. Um, and the details are pretty self-explanatory. What are they gonna get paid? When are they gonna get paid? When are they gonna get their money back? Um, uh, how much money are you raising? Um, what are you going to use their money with for, you know, things like that. So, so disclose, disclaim in details. And you really want to find um, somebody to help you put this together because you need to really be focused on your business and not the legal aspects of it. So that's why I always encourage you to find a securities attorney. Um, you certainly don't have to use me, but I'll be happy to help you. Um, but that's, that's something you want to consider, uh, strongly is to, to invest in a in good legal counsel when it comes to raising capital because look uh there's a lot of people who ruin lives out of there but ruin lives out there by stealing from people uh and and there's a lot of people who go to jail for stealing <laughs> um you know and it's not the traditional like somebody robs you at gunpoint it's literally robbing through false pretenses and you don't want to get caught up in that uh, so, so that's why I, I emphasize this so, so much. So the next thing you need to do, if you're doing either a reg CF or a reg A, you don't necessarily have to do this under rule 506 B or C is you want to audit your books. So you have to find an auditor to audit your books and records. Um, and then this is where it kind of ends for reg CF and reg d 506 b and 506 c because then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to submit to the sec for a regulation a offering and and these are kind of i'm not going to bore you guys i want to take your questions i hope you're asking questions in the comments i don't know how arena is taking questions I assume they're there somewhere. Um, but if you have questions, I want to encourage you to put them together now and put them in the comments because I'm going to take them soon because I don't want to bore you all with this. Um, if you have more questions about uh, Regulation A or you want to see some examples, I'm happy to send you some and, and you can check those out and we can go through this process. Um, Let's see what's next. Oh, yes. So I know this is a lot of information. I just kind of data dump on all of you and uh, I apologize, but that's, I'm a lawyer. That's my job. So, <laughs> so with that being said, if you need more information um, and I'll send, if you don't want to send the email, that's fine. This is an autoresponder, but I'm going to send this to Arena as well and she can get it out to you as well. Um, but this chart if you're, if you're confused about the rules and you're like, what does she say about advertising under Regulation A? Or what did she say about you know 506B? What kind of investors can I take in? This chart will help you figure that out. 
And anytime you look at it, you can think of me fondly. Okay. All right. All right. So this is how you can get in touch with me. And uh, Arena, I'm ready. I'm ready to take questions when when you are ready to give them to me. Thank you so much for sharing everything. Like I actually just wrote a comment. Four years in law school, and I've never got it so so easy like you did. Rich had a great oh. last night. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But now my thing, I, I like I was on a criminal side, like Rich came and t like teach us what's the difference between trademark and patent and how to put <laughs> I mean, like I'm watching those presentations, like I'm hosting them for an hour. And I think, damn, I was four years in school for this. And I, 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 I got it like the hard way. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's delivered a little differently in law school, right? It's exactly. delivered a little differently everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> delivered in such an easy and like very like strategic way that everybody can understand every single like business owner or somebody with a little bit common sense you don't need a law degree to understand and how to take advantage of it um, yeah i also know that there are a lot of like funds available right now and a lot of like grants from government and like yes. it's how, how the, the small owner, like your favorite esthetician can take advantage of those small loans to kind of like help them survive right now? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be straight up with you guys. Like my, um, my partner at first, I told him about the SBA loans. And I think this is what's going on in a lot of the country right now. So really get yourself educated. As a matter of fact, um, um, Arena, I'll send you the link to it. There was a video I watched yesterday, if you, if you want to share it with your group. Um, there was a video I watched yesterday on how to get an SBA loan through the CARES program and uh, or the CARES Act, whatever it's called. Basically, the loan is free. It's, it's, it's not even a loan. It's a grant, but they have to start it off as a loan to ensure that you use it properly. If you don't use it properly, they're going to take the money they're going to make you pay the money back. So when I first told my partner, for example, about the loans that are being offered under the SBA, his response to me was like, I don't want to take on debt. I don't want to take on debt, but it's not debt if you use it the way it's supposed to be used because what ends up happening is it's guaranteed by the SBA and then they turn it into a grant. They don't even um, forgive the loan. It's not even called a loan forgiveness. They literally transform it into a grant. So it's not considered income for you if, they, if you do default on it. Um, it's considered a grant and then you, uh, you basically get free money from the government and you have to use it in three different ways. Um, to pay payroll, to um, uh, pay rent um, and to pay, oh, there's one other thing you can pay. Oh, utilities. So rent, utilities, and payroll. If you use the money for those things and payroll can include things like funding retirement accounts, then it's like free money. You all should be, anybody of you, any of you who have employees out there, all of you should be applying for an SBA loan right now. Um, because you don't know what May is going to bring. And this was like, yeah, we don't need to take on debt right now. Um, fortunately, we're doing okay. Um, but we don't know what April or May are going to bring or even June, July, August. And I don't want to find out the hard way. I don't want to be sleeping on this. So if you haven't gotten an application in, it's super easy. It will take you two minutes to figure, fill out the application. And then the SBA is going to get back to you and tell you what to do next in terms of completing the application with the local bank. Um, and also they're going to send you $10,000 right away um, if they determine that your application is complete enough at, at, at the outset. So yeah, every SBA.gov. I can't, I can't tell you enough to go and do that. SBA.com, right? Yeah, SBA.gov, G-O-V. Yes. Thank you so yeah. much for that. Basically, if, if somebody doesn't take advantage of this, I think just have to be like stupid to throw money they are I know. free i know hello it's crazy. yeah it's crazy and it was funny because like i said i it took me a good week and a half to convince my partner to go in on this because he didn't he couldn't he couldn't understand and i get rightfully so he couldn't understand how is this free money um it's a loan i go no it's not really it's called a loan but it's not so yeah you got to go take advantage of this now
There's and never I, been a time like this. Yeah, and I heard that if you apply right now, they're gonna have like the second and the third series and you will be like very likely to be approved for the upcoming ones because this is just the first part of it. Is that correct? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, but you got it like the, the, I mean, have a scarcity mentality when it comes to this, I, you know, in business, we never want to have a scarcity mentality, but for your own self-preservation, you need to have a scarcity mentality regarding this right now. You need to act now, because if you don't act now there, the money could be gone because they only have a limited supply of loans. So you want to be first in line. Obviously. And every single like, like grounded, like, a uh, human being right now is applying for that because you know why would you not and I, right right yeah you'd have to be crazy <laughs> yes, exactly we also got another question from cindy what type of profits do you have to show on your books in order to be able to raise capital oh zero you could have a loss it doesn't matter you anybody can raise capital anybody can raise capital the issue becomes um if you're raising capital properly under the eyes of the law, are you providing those three? The big thing is the three D's. Are you providing disclosure, disclaimer, and details? Are you taking money from the right investors? Are you advertising the proper way? If you're doing all of those three things, you could have a, you could say, look, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make some widgets and I'm going to sell those widgets in a widget factory. And here are all the risks associated with selling the widgets and, and building the widgets. Um, and, and you can do that. Like I have one of one client that I have, that's like just really an amazing, um, I always like to refer to them because they're a business that are not going to make money for at least 10 years. And, and when I tell you why they're not going to make money for business in 10 years, it's going to make complete sense. They were attempting to 3d print a heart. So it takes a really long time to get FDA approval for a 3d printed heart. Like you can't just like 3D print a heart and throw it into somebody's chest and call it a day. It doesn't work out like that. You got to actually print the heart, do animal testing, do this, that, the other thing. There's a lot of different things that have to be done. So they're not going to make money for 10 years, but if they want to try to get this heart printed and then tested and then, you know, deployed as a viable solution for heart transplants, then they need investor capital. And so that starts today. Exactly. And I feel like it's, it's a, a good balance between having a great idea and knowing where to go and pitch your idea because you're in the beauty right. industry. You, you want to be the next Paul Mitchell and that's correct, but you have to start somewhere and it's mm -hmm. not to go and raise like seven, eight figure funds. Once you got a base and, you know, maybe raise a little bit, show some numbers to go to, you know, and fish for the big fishes. I feel right. Yeah, no. And that's, and, and so that's the thing too, right? Like I had made mention, I, um, I invested in some beauty products, um, on, um, I invested in two beauty product companies on WeFunder and neither of them, like you guys probably have never even heard of either of them. They're brand new companies that had concepts. They were, they happen to be vegan, um, beauty products. And, um, I am a part-time vegan. I would never say I'm a <laughs> Full time vegan. Um, I wouldn't insult real true blue vegans like that, but it's not, it's a cause that I believe in. And so, you know, I saw what they were doing with uh, a variety of different beauty products that, that are, are um, vegan based. So I, I invested in them and I had no reason to believe they were going to make millions and millions of dollars or anything like that, other than the fact that they had like a really good why, a really good business plan and a really good outlook. And I think a lot of people these days, especially people that they do have a like a, a stability and financial wealth, they are not necessarily investing for the um for the product and hoping that they're going to be the next Bill Gates. They invest and help those companies because they care about the cost like you did with those brands and $250 from here, yeah. $50 from here, $2,000 from, from here for somebody that have disposable income, it could make a huge change for you like a small business owner. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, your point exactly. But even, even Bill Gates, like, uh, I don't know if anybody even knows the history of how Microsoft got financed, but they sold junk bonds. 
Microsoft had nothing when they sold junk bonds, which are bonds that are super high risk for a company that might not make it. And the hope is that you buy these bonds that and that this company will, you know, come out of the gates and be amazing. And of course, we all know the history of Microsoft and what happened with them. So you're in good, Bill Gates is a perfect example of, of somebody who took in money from investors um, before they were actually making any real cap, real money. So yeah, I think this is really important for any small salad owners because what Paul mentioned, that's like our end goal to all of us. That's my end goal, everybody's end goal, right? So you you need to shot for the for the moon. At least you you reach the stars, and it's always good time to you know take advantage and, and raise the small money, you know, and establish yourself before you actually go and uh, you know do a big racing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, no, I, I hope I hope you guys you know don't don't fear all these big rules because they apply to you like these are made for the guy the gal the whomever who's trying to who just wants to go to their friends and family and say hey invest in me and when you go to your friends and family you want to put your best face on um pun intended in the beauty industry <laughs> but you really do you want to be you want to have you want to have the best legal documents and the best you want to be a applying the law the best you can um, so that you can instill confidence in potential investors. It's not just about being legally compliant, but it's also about instilling confidence in investors so that they are like, okay, this, this entrepreneur cares enough to put together proper legal documents. It's going to set a tone for your investors in the first place. So again, uh, you want to do it for so you want to be legally compliant and follow the law for so many different reasons. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think like that's very important in the steps of a every single entrepreneurs or salon owners that want to open a new location. And, you know, once you establish your authority and you show up for your work, it's same like when you go in front of the investors, like do your homework, do all the paperwork and the legal part and people, you have no reasons for people to not invest in you, right? Right. Oh, exactly. That's exactly correct. Yes. Uh, any other tips, Jillian, that you'll have with like any small business owner this day, any opportunity to take advantage of because you know the system more than we do and all the grants <laughs> and loan that we can access? Yeah. So the first thing I want to, okay, the first thing I want to tell you guys to do is um, number one, if you're looking at taking in money from investors um, and you only need a small amount of capital, like, and when I say a small amount of capital, I mean a million dollars or less go check out Republic, check out WeFunder, check out Start Engine as resources to help you raise capital, um, number one. Number two, if you're thinking about, I just wanna go to my friends and family and, and see what they can do, but you're not sure how to get that started. The first thing I wanna tell you to do is go to um, one of our Facebook pages. It's called Private Money Rockstar. I have some things on there called Private Money Minutes that will tell you exactly how to raise capital, like how to go out there, how to do it, and they're short little videos. And then the third thing is, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, go to sba.gov and get your loans. Now, you have to actually have, you know, you have to have been in business for the last several months or so. Um, I think you have to have been in business since February. So it's not, or February, maybe it's, I don't remember. Sorry. Don't, don't listen to me about that part. Just go to sba.gov and try to apply because that's free money. <laughs> that's free. <laughs> I, I agree. And if somebody, again, they, they do not do that, they have no excuse to come here and say I'm broke. Like, like uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yesterday, you have an option of getting out of this quarantine with a big butt and be broke or just move your ass and do something. I mean, I, I hate to admit that I'm probably going to leave quarantine with a big butt. I just like, we have so many groceries in the house and it's so easy just to take a left into the kitchen and get whatever you want. So I got to get that under control. And I'm telling everybody I know that I got to get it under control. So I actually do it and people, you know, know about it. <laughs> there you go. You could donate your groceries. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I, I've literally been working out every single day just to try to keep up with this quarantine and it works like mentally it works it distracted you and like it's so good 
Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that under advisement. I'm gonna do that too. I if you if you can be working out and, and where you are, I can be working out where I am. I have no excuses. I'm gonna get on that. You could literally like work on your treadmill and do all those interviews. <laughs> I tell you that you're annoying by walking even on your online live video but I guess it is what it is and your thing Jillian thank you so much and I know your 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 son was affected by by this uh, awful virus I hope he's getting well soon and please keep us updated and thank I you. Can't thank you thank you enough for coming here and sharing all your knowledge with us and guys if you want to reach her to raise money where can they reach you yeah just, go to, just, if you, yeah, just go to crowdfundinglawyers.net. I have um, my calendars right there. Go ahead and make yourself an appointment and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, Jillian. And I will see You're you guys welcome. soon. Thanks. Bye. See you soon. Bye.